Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hey, everybody. So we're going to get to our episode in just a second, but I wanted to make sure that you heard about my latest offering because people have been asking, how can I work with Jolie? And I would love to work with you, but you all have such individual relationships. So I would love to see you pop into my next free live training. It's the best way. Yeah. My it's eyes, right, directly, your relationship. These are small intimate groups. We're just going to meet in Zoom and we're going to talk about what it is that you want and how you can get it. Go to my website, joliehamilton.com. Click on the work with Jolie tab. You'll see some live trainings and masterclasses coming up. Grab a spot at the next one and we'll see you in there. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. And we are talking about optimizing sex. Optimizing sex. <laughs> yes. Um, this show, when I think about this podcast, I think about who my, my dream listener is. And I bet that most of you wouldn't necessarily think of this word, optimizing. That's the thing that I think all of you are doing, whether you know it or not. I think that you're listening to a podcast like this because you actually want to optimize the, the experience you have in your love, in your relationship, in your, or in the re relationships you hope to have. Optimizing isn't about perfection. It's about continual improvement and experimentation and creating better and better systems. And that is so what I'm all about. So today we're going to talk about optimizing sex, optimizing your sex life. And if you have a sex life and you want one, who wouldn't want to optimize it? I mean, I don't know why we wouldn't personally, because even if sex isn't super important to you, um, most of us want to have more pleasant experiences rather than less pleasant right, experiences. Right. So yes. Now, unfortunately, in order to optimize your sex life, you're going to have to talk about it. But I don't think that's news to anybody listening to this program. <laughs> And it's, um, I, I know why you say, unfortunately, particularly with your experience with me, because it took me a while to warm up to the idea of talking um, about sex, about how to do things better. Yeah. But my experience has been that every single conversation we have, even the ones that don't go well, make it better. Right. Like they don't feel good in the moment. That's what I mean by don't go well. Yeah, um, some of them don't. Some of them don't feel good in the moment. And we've created a culture of where everything is talk aboutable. There right. is nothing is taboo, even stuff that's taboo. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so when we have been uncomfortable talking about a particular aspect of our sex life, it's tended to be for me, exciting. So the, the feeling, uh, one of the ways I transform the feeling of, oh, this is going to be an uncomfortable conversation is by entering into it from a place of, oh, actually, this is an exciting opportunity for me to get to know you better. Oh, so you kind of, so it's like mindset. I game, I game the system. You game the system. Yeah. So before I give a big talk, the same thing happens. I get a little nervous. I don't know exactly what the audience is going to do, what they're going to want. You're my audience in that scenario, right? Or some one other my sex partner may be an, an audience. Um, there is a moment before a conversation where I can be having butterflies in my stomach. I could be... Um, feeling shaky or like, I don't know where my words have gone. It's less and less for me these days. Okay. Let's Good. be real. Yeah. Almost never. Not but never not though. Not never. Not at all. I've seen you 
get yeah, nervous. It still happens. And, um, because it's, I'm revealing a part of myself just in showing yeah. that I want to have the conversation. But by telling myself that this is an opportunity to know you better and to let you know me better. Because you like to be seen. Everything. Being seen is being loved. And I, I don't think that, I don't think that there's an end point to that. That's, that's the experience, the experience of continually being known as my changing, growing self, right? Yeah. So why do you think so, so optimizing the, the kind of the, you're, you're sta- saying it in a way that you can always optimize. So why isn't there like an end point? These two people, they work through all their, you know, they have all their communication and, and they figure out how to do feedback. And um, why isn't there a spot where they're like, okay, got it. Oh, because you have bodies and <laughs> we have bodies. They're going to change. We have mm. bodies and they're going to change. We have minds. They're going to change. We have hearts. They're going to shift. We have, we have souls. We have a, a life experience. We have external contexts and internal states of being and all these things are, are shifting and changing. And so just because we've figured out a pattern that works for us right now, doesn't mean it's going to be the optimal pattern five minutes from now for that matter. Uh-huh. So All right, that makes a lot of sense. It's a huge opportunity. And the key way to, to do this optimizing is to learn how to give your partner feedback about sex. Yeah. So that does sound a little dicey and fraught thinking, okay, here's this person who has agreed to have sex with me and be intimate. And now I'm going to, and that's a wonderful gift. And now I'm going to somehow figure out how to tell them that's a great gift. Could it be a little different over here? And doing that without hurting feelings. Okay. Or there you go. What are we, how? That's the first thing that I see when I'm talking to clients about, okay, how are we going to have this conversation? How are you going to deliver feedback? Is... A lot of people just avoid doing that ever because they don't want to hurt their partner's feelings. Mm-hmm. Well, that 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 avoidance, that that sh- that part of you that you're putting away, that desire that you're putting away and saying, "Nah, I would rather I would rather not get what I want so that they feel comfortable." Well, first off, you don't know that they feel more that that they're going to feel more or less comfortable just because you're bringing them feedback. Uh-huh. You're you're making an assumption there. But also there's a little self-abandonment going on right away. Like okay, I would rather make myself uncomfortable rather than potentially make you uncomfortable. I'm going to speak for myself entirely now. That's my martyr. That's what he does. Okay. So when we're thinking I about would complexes, rather, yep, no, you have a martyr complex. I have a martyr complex and I'm like, okay, I can I actually too. feel good about um, suffering, suffering, um, not getting what I want because I'm giving you something. And also, oh, by the way, now I have one up on you. Oh, there you go. You place yourself in a one up position. <laughs> Sometimes. And yep. then, yeah. And, and this happens yep. to me too. This, this is. This is a really common pattern. So let's make it practical. What kind of thing might we want to give feedback about? What's something you've needed to give feedback about at some point? Um, Technique. Yeah. Okay. How about like, let's make it really specific. How do you want your, how do you want your genitals touched? Lightly. At least my testicles. Oh yeah. There you go. Okay. There's one part. I am not a fan of some of the things that I have seen happen. (laughs) It does not work for me. So, and I have had to. You need to give real time feedback. feedback. That's a good time for real time feedback. So earlier, when you were doing that excruciating thing to me, could you not do that anymore (laughs) for twenty minutes? Yeah, (laughs) because wow, if you didn't, yeah, give real time feedback, that that you'd experience real pain. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we can get really specific about the kind of feedback we need to give, Mm -hmm. but let's just say. This could be any sort of feedback. This could be um, information about how you want to be touched, how you would like to be able to touch someone, the stories you want to share, the the fantasies that are in your head, games you want to play, roles you want to toy with, Uh, toys you want to introduce, ways you like to touch yourself, um, experimental stuff that you don't even know whether you like, but you might want to. 
there's, I mean, I could, I could start a list and just keep writing and never finish. There are so many things that you might want to give feedback about that. Yeah. And it just occurred to me that one of the things you might offer feedback on is um, asking about trying something new. It's not just about yeah. um, changing what's happening, but to add something. Right. Wow, so cool. when we are, when we're in that martyring position, when we're like, okay, I, I'm just going to not say anything. One of the big things that I see happen is um, people will come to me and say, so how do I get them to stop doing this? Or how do I get her to, to, to change that? Or how do I get them to, how do I get them to stop licking my ear? <laughs> uh-huh. Right? Like, how do I get them? Because you know, it was cute when we were dating, but now it's been 20 years and they still do this thing. But now it feels so awkward to bring it up. How do I tell them? So, so if you're in an early phase, I just want to say, remember, you don't want to have the 20 year later conversation. Oh, it's only going to okay. increase in awkwardness. Um, but one quick suggestion is it's OK to have changed your mind. Maybe it really was okay. Maybe maybe the ear licking thing totally got you off right at the beginning and maybe that shifted or perhaps something about your body changed or whatever. It's okay to have changed your mind. So you could just approach it from that spot and say, "So, let's 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 have a time when we can when we can talk about what we actually want and it's okay to simply say, "You know that thing that you do? It was great." And turns out my body just wants something different now yeah defang the yeah. the thing by rather than saying so you've been doing this thing for 20 years and i hate it and that really sucks right so right. there are ways and ways to do this. <laughs> right and so this is about kindness mm -hmm. but it is not a kindness to simply suffer in silence right it's not so, a kindness to you and it's not a kindness to your partner it's mm -hmm. not going to increase your intimacy we were recently talking about um talking with our partner and you said something about being on the same page about working together yeah and that i think ideally is what you would do with the feedback it's like we're both on board for making sex better right so how about we here here's a suggestion of request whatever i have what i have love you that so yeah um that's great i think it's it's interesting though to hear you say that because you've lived lots of your life not ever even having that first conversation right. about are we on this on the same page about Just, wanting to yeah. make our sex life better yep. for both of us and so the very first step is about shifting the culture where hey can we make this thing great together yeah and while that might not feel super easy that changes everything across the board that's not just about your sex life so that's a cultural shift like changing the microculture that your your relationship is once you've shifted that a lot of conversations become possible this is creating mm -hmm. a culture of talk about yep. that's what i want in my house and that is what i have found works the best over the long term is creating that that option now that said there's something that happens a lot that causes a lot of trouble around giving feedback. When, when we want to tell our partner not to do something, that's important. But sometimes it's not so much that we don't want them to do something. It's that what they're doing doesn't quite work right. Like it doesn't do anything. It's not really negative. We're just like, ah, uh, it's just not working. And we don't know what to ask for instead. Oh, if you don't know what you actually want, then you may avoid having a conversation about optimizing because you're like, well, I don't want them to touch me this way. Like, like I, I don't want to have, I don't want to have my nipples sucked on, but I haven't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what else would work. So whatever, I'll just do what we've been doing. This is a great opportunity. Yeah. So what, what's the opportunity there? <sighs> Following pleasure is um <laughs> so much more life force can be discovered if we can learn how to follow pleasure um a resource that i can offer along these lines um i have a free ebook 
on my website. I'll link it in the show notes here called The Pleasure Experiment. Um, it's also available in a little audio format, little, little two-minute episodes of little experiments that you can do with yourself to figure out what pleasure is what for you, what feels good. And it's not just about sex, all kinds of pleasure. So sex isn't it's not just touching. It's not just genitals. It's not just getting off. Um, the sound environment that you're in mm. may be impacting your sex life. In fact, I've had this conversation with you over and over again. I'm like, we have a house full of kids. Could we turn on some music and like shift this, you know, shift the yeah. mood in our locked bedroom? And like, and that's been something I've brought over and over again because it really does help me. Um, but it doesn't on face value look like it has anything to do with sex, right? But it does have yeah, to do with my if, pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I needed to identify what worked for me because it's not true that just any music works. For instance, I don't want to listen to Rush. You're a man of a certain age. That would not work for Rush you. Rush is just part of your vernacular. But that doesn't work for me. So we White created Snake, on the other hand. <laughs> I do have an eclectic taste. A, a sex playlist is really helpful. Yeah, yeah. And you can borrow other people's and try those out too. Um, but it's not just it's not just one thing. It's learning to follow pleasure will allow you to be in a dialogue about what feels pleasurable, allow you to give feedback. So yeah, like how about a masturbation practice? And I really mean it. Like practice experiments trying stuff out so that you can bring to, remember, to your partner to, yeah like, so like, here's a thing so what's that's... what's working especially oh, oh. i found that was really important um and for myself and for clients who, that i worked with um especially when i was doing postnatal doula work um we would talk after birth well i mean the body has just experienced a whole bunch of stuff you just grew a human you are a 3d printer you grew a human with spare parts you had lying around your uterus yay you and then you either pushed it out of yourself or experienced a surgical procedure that completely opened you so that this this alien reason thing could exit you. Maybe a couple of them at a time. Uh -huh. Stuff's going to change. It, that sounds like it. Yeah. Right? So it's a great time to reintroduce yourself to what actually feels pleasurable. Um, okay. It, so that's how... That's a really significant transition that you're describing right there. It's it's a big one. It's but not the are, only one. But there are small ones, too, that can inspire oh, yeah, sure. changes in pleasure. And so keeping track of I mean, you had a vasectomy, and... and I remember there being a shift for you. Yeah. There was, there was like three, four months there after your vasectomy where stuff worked a little different, and you were experimenting. Yeah. And... That was helpful because you could give me feedback about what was working and what wasn't. Yeah. And the spirit of how the feedback is offered is one thing. You know, so that's the part I have control over. If I'm the one that's offering you feedback, I have control over how I offer it. So I can create a culture where everything is talk aboutable. I can then set us up for a great conversation where we are talking about sex and it's fun and pleasant and not at a time when we need to also say talk about religion, money, and politics. Oh, you know, mm. maybe just you know, like yeah. clear a little space okay. and make it make it pleasant to talk about by by getting on the same page. Yeah, and then remember that it it's we don't have to cover everything all at once. Oh yeah, we can just talk about a little thing even because sometimes a small change is enough to get things moving, get like, get, get some forward motion in the, in the experiment that all of our sex lives really are. We're, we're growing, we're changing, we're aging. And I, yep. I kind of yeah. love the aging part of, of my sex life. Like, what do you love about that? The, um, okay. Oh, so actually so much. I think I could do a whole episode yeah, on the that. Top three, maybe. Then. Yay. Okay. So I'm 45 now and I feel so excited about how my, my awareness of the, the, the small motions that can be very erotic. Like I'm, I'm increasingly more fine tuned to what I actually want and what's just okay. But also I, I feel, um, I feel different sensations, things that I don't know, maybe they existed when I was younger, but I have no recollection of them. Mm. It feels like, I don't, 
feel like there's a finer resolution to the whole being meanness. That sounds nice. Yeah. Makes the orgasm really fun. So yay. Oh so, yay. Anyways, um so, I think that just just allowing for the fact that that change has happened mm -hmm. and for me to be in the in the experiment with you, yeah, it's normal to need to give you feedback and say, hey, this isn't working or this is. So am I do more of that? Yeah. <laughs> My, in my first marriage, there weren't the discussions that naturally led to this. And, and for various reasons, uh, yeah, we never had those, those conversations. Um, but it sounds like you did. What, uh, what, what lessons did you take out of your first marriage about feedback? Oh, goodness. Okay. There were a couple of big ones that were very tough. Um, I didn't know how to deliver uh, feedback tactfully. Okay. So what happened was I, I instigated change, but a lot of times that change would come with a real shutdown. And I look back now and I think, oh, yeah, I didn't learn how to deliver um, a message with, with kindness. So there were times when I managed kindness sort of by accident, but I thought it was enough to just say the thing. Just say it like rip off a band. I was mm -hmm. a very rip off the band aid okay. sort of person, and uh, apologies to my first husband because that's not kind. On the other hand, um, I also learned that being listened to is really powerful. Sometimes our partner can't do the thing we're hoping for, it just doesn't, it either doesn't work for them, or their body can't do it, or they can't figure it out, or we have it in our imagination that this is the thing we want, but like, it's just not coming together. And something that I, I achieved a few times, but not always was sometimes I could just let it be enough that he had heard me. He had, that he had oh, heard okay. that I wanted this thing. He knew he couldn't deliver on it because our, our sexualities didn't line up in all the ways. And also, you know, I'm, I'm, extremely pansexual so i had some desires that like didn't fit into the fairly straight cis het normative sex we were having but being listened to helped a okay. lot that makes sense because i mean you said being seen is being loved yeah that felt so compassionate you were seen yeah and you do the same for me sometimes i'm I feel lost because I can't, I, I can't figure out how to get what I want. It feels just out of reach mm -hmm. somehow. You sit with my discomfort. You don't try to fix it. And that was, mm, that's yeah. a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, when we're having an optimizing conversation, letting you know, or you letting me know what kind of support we want yeah. is, I think that's it. That's the pivotal move that shifted my conversations from being uncomfortable conversations to being generative, even if they weren't um, pleasant to have, they were generative. And that is deciding what I needed for yeah. myself. So let's say I, I'm coming to you and I say, so uh, my orgasm just isn't, it's just not, I, I, I can't find it right now. It's just, it feels out of reach and I'm really struggling. If I start down that road and you accidentally hear that as you're doing something wrong, like yeah. you could immediately make it about you. But if, if before I start down that road, if I, if I say, so I have something I'd like to talk about um, and it might feel a little tender. And I just want to say that all I'm looking for is to be heard and for you to know that I'm not, I'm not right now asking you to fix anything. Cause I don't know. I don't even know what the fix would be. Mm -hmm. But could you listen and support me in the idea that that over time we'll figure out the next steps? Yeah, and Boom. there got All a different of a sudden, situation. We're, we're on the same page, and now you you don't have to fix something. That, how the heck would you know? How to, if I've lost lost my orgasm, how would you know where to find it? If I knew how, well, we would have a lot more money than we have right now. <laughs> I could sell right. that. <laughs> um, so and. F what I know about about my side of things is that when you come to me and say, here's a thing, a really, really game-changing response from me is, how can I support you in that? 
rather than jumping, as I have so often done, to trying to fix it right away or assuming I know. Or I assuming that you, I'm even wanting a fix. Or, right. Yeah. And, um, yeah. How, how can I support you? And the answer may be, I don't need any support. I just wanted to say a thing. Yeah. Um, and it can be anywhere from that to, would you help me brainstorm and experiment and figure out ways to fix it? Yeah. But I don't know until I've asked you. Yeah. So if you don't volunteer the, and this is what I'm looking for, um, I have been not, I haven't nailed this, but I've been working to remember to ask, so how do I support you? I use this particular example because this is a real life one. So there was a period of time, I believe it was, it started in December of 2015, I think. No, 14, December of 2014, my orgasm was gone. It was just gone. And I had no idea what was happening. Um, nothing, nothing really made sense. Like nothing had really changed mm -hmm. particularly. It, was, it actually wasn't one of the more, we've had some real doozies of years. Yeah, that one wasn't been, actually that yeah. impressive. Um, and I managed to ask you to just be patient while I... Um, did a lot of experimentation and I asked you to be present for it. Right. Um, because I didn't want to feel like I was like hiding in a room alone, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And it, we changed our sexual pattern and you were present to my sort of seeing what different ways of touching myself or figuring out which ways I needed to play with toys or what stories we, we just experimented. And three or four months later, everything was different again. That time had passed. And I <laughs> I didn't expect that to happen. I didn't expect to have to go through it. It was, it was shocking and overwhelming when it happened because it, it was overnight. It just happened yeah, immediately. I, I do but remember your patience that. patience and not trying to fix it and also not or at least from my perspective, you didn't take it personally. Um, you might have. I think if that had happened a few years earlier, you might have taken it personally. I because might have. They, there was a, a bit of a like theme around like giving someone an orgasm. Yep. Not just you. I've gotten this from a lot yeah, of lovers. No, I'm not alone in that. This idea of giving someone an orgasm. But over the, the time. But luckily, we had gotten to a spot where that we wasn't a big deal, and you were and... you were patient, and you allowed yourself to sit with my frustration over because oh yeah. my god i was so frustrated um you were you witnessed that without trying to fix it and over time whatever it was whether that was physical or emotional i will never know for sure because i i experimented in a bunch of ways and eventually that time passed and I, I, that is, that was the first experience I had of, of really of writing and journaling about how, oh, we're just, we're just going to go through this mm -hmm. together. We're just going to go through it. And I don't know what's going to happen. So what I hear you saying right there, even talking about feedback and in order to give, in order to give feedback, uh, you're going to want to know what you want. Yeah. And so what happened there was you... I you needed to go looked, on a journey of self-discovery. You looked at what you wanted and asked for what you needed to make that happen yeah. for you. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what it was going to be. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a process. It was an unfolding. Yeah. Okay. So that's like a, you know, I'm thinking like classifying the feedback. Um, please do this different. Please don't do this. Please start doing this thing. And please work with me to figure out what works. Yeah. Like there's a whole other oh, category of, of feedback. Please be patient. Request. Please be patient while I while figure, I out, figure out, out how this works. Yeah. And, and I'm sure there are others. We could, we could keep yep. adding to that list. But when I think about optimizing for <laughs> increasingly connective and mm -hmm. delicious sexual experience, I think just allowing it to be a process, an adventure, Mm -hmm. together together i think is the the key and it helps with the worry about hurting feelings with feedback oh we're doing yeah, this together doing this together so and this is a place where i'm, I'm going to give props to my parents dysfunctional as they were 
nailed this one. I, my parents talked to me about their sex lives when, when I was an adult, when I, when I was a full on adult, they would talk to me like I was a person, um, who maybe didn't necessarily want all of this information, <laughs> but, but actually it was, it was lovely. They would talk about, yeah, you know, this stopped working or that stopped working and here, you know, well, whatever, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep figuring out what works for us. I, that was how I learned that no matter how dysfunctional your relationship was, because they had some serious problems with codependency and, and um, some addictive stuff going on and hoarding and all sorts of troubles, but that place, they showed up for each other hmm. despite erectile dysfunction and um, all kinds of changes to my mother's body while she had 11 surgeries in seven years and they showed up. What a great model so, yeah, I had. You had a great I'm model so of, grateful for them for that. Of mutual participation in, yeah. in what they were doing. Let's all stay with the process. Awesome. And optimize the hell out of these sex lives. Yes. Okay. So until next time. Keep talking to each other. Hey, everybody. So we've talked quite a bit about how to do relationships. But I know a lot of you would really like to get my eyes on your relationship specifically. It's so worth it. And yeah, that's a bit of a hard thing for me to do for everyone individually, unless you're actually working in my coaching program. But good news, I'm doing some free live trainings. Yay! Yay. Live that's, trainings. that's awesome. I mean, I get it all the time. I'm with you all the time. It's I get true. lots of training and, and you're just in one so... big free live training. And oh, wait, I, you pay for it. Okay, maybe I pay for it a little, <laughs> but you don't have to. Okay, so I would love to, to have y'all click on over to my website, joliehamilton.com. And if you click on the tab that says work with Jolie, you're going to see my latest offering for a live training. These are 60 minute masterclasses in how we can relate better. I'm going to be covering topics like creative monogamy, like how to transition into consensual non-monogamy, if that's your thing. And I'm also going to be talking about something that is really in my wheelhouse and something that we don't talk about on this show as often as we might, which is how to have a completely kick-ass relationship that really empowers you to be your full CEO mm -hmm. power player self. Right. So in my other world, I do a lot of business coaching. So... Bring it on. Bring it on. And you've all here heard us talking about our relationship and you have heard how she has addressed all of our issues in our relationship and how we talk about it. And she will turn that attention on you. And it is amazing what you can learn. Well, thanks. And yeah, just jump on over. Love to see you in there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to jolie at joliehamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.